As the American entertainment industry pursues its strategy of rebooting and remaking everything under the sun, it makes sense that it would eventually set its sights on other cultures. For better or worse, the West has always had a kind of infatuation with Asian culture, but it feels like in the last several years, there's been an uptick in Eastern and Eastern themed stories for Western audiences. And one controversy that seems to follow these productions is who is cast to perform in them. When telling stories using Asian characters for a Western audience, do you cast based on the source material, based on the race of your intended audience, based on some other factor? The practice of casting characters of color to be played by Caucasian actors has come to be called whitewashing, which both includes and is distinct from Asian erasure. And that's what we're gonna talk about on this episode of Idea Channel. And to do that, we're gonna talk with my friend Kevin Nguyen. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, do you wanna tell us a little bit about like who you are, what you do? Yeah, I'm here because I'm Asian and I have strong opinions about whitewashing. Um, I'm the digital deputy editor at GQ. And I've written a lot about whitewashing recently um, and it's a topic that I have many opinions on, and I think kind of like the internet, I love to I love to yell about whitewashing, but <laughs> in that yelling, I think a lot of the nuance kind of gets lost, because whitewashing is like a very specific thing, and when we talk about whitewashing, uh, we're talking about a small part of Asian erasure. So I think the big things we're gonna be talking about throughout the episode are these ideas of whitewashing and Asian erasure. So I was wondering if you could just sort of walk us through in general terms, what each of those things is. Yeah, I mean, whitewashing, I think whitewashing has the clearest definition. Um, it's when you take a role that really should go to a person of color and then you cast a white person um, in their stead. Um, and you know, Hollywood makes a lot of excuses for why they have to do this. You know, it makes the movie more bankable. Um, but the reality is that, you know, um, they're never gonna see people of color do all the box office if they never put them in those roles in the first place. Um, so whitewashing things like pretty clear cut. Uh, Asian erasure is kind of a more nebulous thing, um, but you know, in a lot of culture um, throughout history, um, Asians, Asian Americans just haven't really been present. Um, there still aren't a lot of Asian movie stars. Um, you don't really see a lot of Asian men and women in TV, in music, you know, some are there, uh, but the reality is that, you know, like we've largely been cut out of the picture. So I think the fact that uh, Asian erasure does sit within this larger, more complicated idea of whitewashing and there are these different, not like versions of it, but like instances and different ways that you see it um, happening in entertainment that we might go through like a short list of movies uh, that have, I think, inspired different versions of this conversation in the past couple years. Uh, and talk about maybe where they sit? Does that sound like, like a, an instructor? Sounds fun, let's do, do it. Okay. Whitewashing or not. <laughs> yeah. So the first, the most recent and big one, the major from Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, flagrant whitewashing. You know, the character in the original, um, both in the manga and the anime, um, has a Japanese name. Um, she had Japanese features. Um, they cast Scarlett Johansson as her. And that to me seems like a pretty flagrant case of whitewashing. So this one I know is a little bit more complicated and we're gonna talk about it more later, but uh, Matt Damon in The Great Wall had some comp like a lot of controversy surrounding it. Yeah, I'm gonna just say not whitewashing, um, still maybe problematic. Um, I think what people reacted to was the idea that Matt Damon had come to save the poor Chinese people um, and protect The Great Wall. His character is written to be like a European who comes, comes east, so not whitewashing, but maybe like a white savior problem. So the next one, also recent, but a little complicated, which is Danny Rand from Iron Fist, who is a uh, canonically Caucasian character. Right, um, I'm gonna say it's not whitewashing, but it certainly has its problems. Um, there's a strange thing when you adapt something, uh, you kind of want to be protective of the source material. And I think in this case, the source material is also a little troubling. I mean, that character probably should have been Asian um, from the get-go. It's sort of like just repeating the mistakes of the source right, material. you know, and it's like the uh, adherence to adapting it um, has, I think, been used more as an excuse to not fix that character. Sort of related, but maybe the, like, the other way around is the ancient one from the recent Doctor Strange movie with Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, uh, whitewashing, I think, because um, the original ancient one um, was a Tibetan character, um, but also like a Tibetan character that was wrapped in all of this weird oriental, um, a lot of bad stereotypes. Um, and this was an opportunity to sort of solve that. And that's sort of what Tilda Swinton says when she defends the character. It's like, oh, like, instead of having, you know, an Asian man with all these negative stereotypes associated with it, like... Just clean the slate. Just clean the slate, like, just making me, Tilda Swinton. And I think that 
impulse, it seems like a good one, but also you're just saying that you couldn't write an Asian character without negative stereotypes. It doesn't seem that hard. And finally, uh, the new Netflix series that just got announced, Death Note, the main character, Light. Yeah, I, I feel like that specific character is whitewash, but it's hard to describe whitewashing to the whole show. Because, um, you know, at the root of whitewashing, the reason we care about it is it's a matter of representation. And that show has black actors, it actually has like a pretty diverse cast. Um, and, you know, the real issue with whitewashing isn't necessarily that like that character has to be Asian. It's more like this was an opportunity to cast a person of color and you chose not to. Um, so those opportunities are there in a lot of the Death Note cast. I've seen the justification for um, Asian erasure basically come across as something like, you know, maybe it's bad that you have a white person playing an Asian character, um, or you have these stereotypes, but like on the whole, like the Asian community is, especially in media and entertainment, like portrayed really well. You know, like usually Asian characters are smart. You know, they're like surgeons or computer programmers or, um, you know, athletic geniuses. So like, what do you really have to complain about? Yeah, I mean, the reality is like, you're just saying that the justification for whitewashing is that like, oh, there are a bunch of Asian stereotypes, um, some good, you know, and that doesn't- right. Everybody knows how to play the violin. Yeah, exactly. I mean, representation isn't just like, you have an Asian guy play like a nerd all the time, right? Like Asians need to be nerds. They need to be superheroes. They need to be everything in between. And still like we never have uh, plot lines where um, like Asian men are romantically involved with anyone, right? Um, sometimes there's a white guy that dates an Asian woman, but that's like as close as you get. I never thought about that before. There, so it, there is remarkably little, like Asi like an Asian main character, uh, like male love interest. I guess like the one recent example of um, an Asian American man on TV that actually has like romance encounters, uh, Aziz Ansari's Master of None. Mm -hmm. um, but this show literally came out like a year ago, um, and he made it himself. And a lot of what the show is doing is talking about dating in New York. Is it's kind of tired subject matter, but like we've never really seen it dealt with from the perspective of an Asian American man. And there's a reason that people really like that show and why people call it like refreshing and groundbreaking. When it's really not doing that much, it's just offering you a slightly different perspective on something you're very familiar with. So can we talk a little bit about the role of um, Matt Damon in The Great Wall and about sort of the, the, the white savior showing up? Like, Beyond the story level justifications of like, oh, this is the point, this guy is supposed to show up and, and serve this very specific purpose. There was also like an, like an economic mandate for involving Matt Damon. China for a while has been trying to make a movie break out internationally. Um, so The Great Wall is a pretty naked attempt at that. Um, it does a lot of the things Chinese movies do, um, and then it imitates a lot of things that American movies do. Um, and then they just kind of transplanted Matt Damon into that sure. role. Some part of me wants to root for, you know, a Chinese film like breaking out internationally. Um, nothing's really broken out since Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. But what's interesting about that is that movie in no way panders to uh, an audience um, outside of its own. And the reason that The Great Wall fails so spectacularly, because it's not really made for Chinese audiences and it's not made for American audiences and it's just somewhere in between. And maybe that's the problem with all these movies is that they don't really seem to know their audience. The Great Wall, uh, it's, you know, doesn't quite resonate with Chinese audiences. It definitely doesn't resonate with American audiences. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, is it made for fans of the original? Is it made for a broader audience? It ends up being somewhere in between um, and only brought in less than $20 million at the box office its opening weekend, which is pretty brutal for like a $200 million movie. And how do you feel about the, the then return sort of counter argument of like, well listen, either China really wants to try to break into the global entertainment market, wants to make movies that take off all over the world, mm -hmm. and to do that, they just, they, ha they have to include these bankable stars, and it's whether or not it ends up being a successful movie, in even getting it made in the first place, they have to sell it with the involvement of Matt Damon. And so just like, bear with us while we figure this out. You know, it just seems like a pretty brutal miscalculation to think that you need um, Matt Damon to, to sell your movie. Um, you know, maybe like it's hard for, maybe there are machinations within Hollywood that make it difficult, like including funding and getting certain directors on board. Um, but the reality is like, if you want to make a movie for everyone, it's going to end up being for nobody. Um, 
you know, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is probably China's biggest export um, ever in terms of a film. And that's, that's a very distinctly Chinese movie. And, you know, it's not that it translates well overseas, it's just that it's a good ass movie and people want to watch it. It's very confidently what it is. Exactly, it yeah. coherent aesthetic to it. I think it's a great point. It's just, it's like being confident in the vision of um, what you want to make. Um, whereas, you know, like when you start thinking about, even actually if you bring up the question of whether your lead should be, we should replace him with a white person, you've already lost some of that confidence, right? You're already worried about the bankability of it and you've already kind of diminish the vision of, of what you're doing. One of the other counter arguments that I hear a lot and heard a lot surrounding Ghost in the Shell was, you know, you talk to the director of the original anime or you talk to Japanese people who love the franchise and they're like, oh, it's fine. Like, you, like we, give, we give Scarlett Johansson a pass. Like, that's okay, we, we don't mind, so everybody can chill out. You know, there was, a, there was like a great YouTube video where um, someone asked when ScarJo was announced, um, asked a bunch of people in Japan if they cared about it, um, and they don't, because Asian representation is not a problem in Japanese films, because they're predominantly cast with Japanese people. Um, I think whitewashing is particular to, to America in a lot of ways. Um, where the Asian American experience is just not represented um, in any major media or very little major media. Um, so it's always funny where they try and get like, they're just like, oh, but the real Asians over there have given us their blessing. And that's an extremely disingenuous and at worst like insidious way of diminishing um, charges of whitewashing. So I want to ask everyone's favorite question, which is just, uh, who cares? We're talking about fictional characters in fictional stories. You know, everybody just has to calm down. It's fake, it gets to be whatever it wants because it's fake. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the sort of real world, maybe more practical effects of this kind of storytelling and, and erasure. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there are some days where I barely care. Um, I didn't want to care about a Ghost in the Shell movie. Um, but it's important because, you know, representation in media is important. If we want to see representation, it has to be in everything from, you know, like small indie movies all the way up to your big blockbuster movies. Um, and also if, you know, whitewashing is going to continue to happen, like that's something we have to be vigilant about and keep calling out when we see it. I think the interesting thing is that like, you know, when people say who cares, the denial of, you know, like these whitewashing claims is kind of like a denial of experience. Um, and that's the problem. Asian Americans want representation because they want the Asian American experience to be seen and heard and for people to recognize it. And the other thing too is there are a lot of people that believe that like, you know, the solution to race is like one day we're all colorblind and no one thinks about it. When the reality is that, you know, the, things are only gonna get better if we're always all thinking about it and always cognizant and, and conscious of it. I think that about does it. So thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it was super fun to have you here. Um, we'll put links to all the places you can find Kevin on the internet in the description. Also, let us know in the comments your questions or comments about uh, whitewashing, Asian erasure, um, and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. Maybe we can rope you in. Absolutely. And send you some via email. We can get some of your thoughts. Yeah. All right, we'll see you around. Thanks, man. Let's high five gently. <laughs> we'll speed that up in post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding CRISPR and editing the genes of your children. That will be out on Friday, which if everything goes according to plan, is tomorrow. Speaking of which, if you haven't seen Vanessa's documentary, Mutant Menu, that is now out. We'll put a link to that in the doobly-doo. It is super good, and uh, thanks to everybody who came to the screening. It's great to see you, great to hang out. Great to watch Vanessa's work with you. And hey, while we are thanking people for being in places in Meat Space, thanks to everybody who came to the Meme Factory show last week. It was really great to see you, to hang out, and to, to chat about the state of the internet memes uh, at this moment. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit, and the tweet of the week comes from Luke Beeman, who points us towards an article about Matt Fury killing Pepe. Pepe is dead. Long live Pepe. And one final bit of news, which is unrelated to basically everything, but is still just cool, so I want to mention it. If you remember a while ago, Twitch teamed up with the Bob Ross Foundation to stream every episode of The Joy of Painting, and that is happening again, except with the Fred Rogers Foundation and Mr. Rogers. So that's going to start happening soon. We're going to put a link in the doobly-doo to where you can learn more about it. 
because you're probably excited about I mean, I'm very excited about it, so I'm gonna assume and hope that you also are excited to hear about this. It's like just announced today, so thrilled. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without these gentle high-fivers. I, I cut my finger, which is why we had to high-five gently, but it's, it's better now. But uh, I probably will have a scar. But I'm okay now, so don't worry. <laughs>